Hey everyone, it's Chris Chico, and today I have a special YouTube interview with my good friend here, Todd Toback, and we are going to be discussing and how is it that you can go out and go from a solopreneur in terms of your real estate business to building a business that then doesn't allow your uh, your involvement on a day-to-day -day basis while still maintaining amazing profit margins because that's one of the things that you and I spoke mm -hmm. about right before we turned the camera on and that is the fact that a lot of times what you see out there is not what is reality and mm -hmm. you can go out and try to build a real estate team of 15 people and yeah you're doing 10 to 15 deals a month but I know uh, certain ba certain situations uh, so I know of certain real estate businesses that uh, you would look at it and say oh my god they must be making so much money and in the end you could just go out and do one deal yourself and make as much money net as they are with a 15 person mm -hmm. team and uh, that's what uh, that's why uh, Todd's a good friend of mine uh, we've known each other for 10 plus years and we always try to get together when I'm in California and uh, and him and I agree we were both on the same page in terms of this and that's the reason why we're here today and uh, welcome to the channel well thank you Chris <laughs> really really appreciate it. I know we've been talking about this for a few months and uh, man I think I'm really looking forward to slicing through the BS. Yes, yes. Um, that's actually one of my superpowers is uh, whenever I get together with someone, I, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, my right. wife uh, my wife says, oh, I can't believe you asked him that. I'm like, hey, uh, what's your net? Right, yes. <laughs> and she's like, hey, this is not like dinner conversation. Right, yes. But, yes. Uh, you know, I don't know, since we have YouTube channels and we, we're both educators, I believe in the truth, right? And one of my sayings is um, be a truth teller and a truth seeker. Yeah. And so I think uh, if you want to serve our viewers, that's what we're here to do today. Yeah, and it's funny because uh, I, I, whenever you ask somebody, hey, how's your real estate business doing? Right, they say, oh, I'm doing 10 deals a month or 15 oh, yeah. deals a month. Or 100 or, deals a month. Or they say, oh, uh, I, I have a 15 person team. Or I'm in 20 markets. I'm in 20 markets. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I have a 30. Yeah, that was a. Yeah. That, so, but that doesn't say anything. Doesn't say right. anything. And the issue that I have with that, the issue that, and that's why I want to talk to, uh, talk to everyone about this today, is that the issue that I have with that is, is that if, if, if I talk to you and I'm beginning and you say, I'm doing 15 deals a month and um, I'm doing direct mail, as an example. Yep. And then, I, you tell me you're sending out 100,000 postcards a month, right? But I, and then I say, you know what? Maybe that's the solution. I need to go balls out right. and I need to send out 100,000 postcards a month. But I don't know that you're netting, say, 20 grand a month because after all your expenses and everything else, like you're, you're netting as much as somebody just doing one deal. Well, I've seen a lot of that, yeah. right? And I think one of the things people even talk about is you need to be very, very, very careful. And we talked about this, the word is staying in your lane. Right. Because you don't know. First of all, then when that their deal size, yes, right, their cost of acquisition, how much time they're spending in the business, how many lost opportunities, how much time if they're even paying attention to their numbers, right, right, and and so it's a lot of times you get in this feeling of feeling less than, right, right, when really you could be doing much more than, right, right, and so I think let, let's get into. Yeah. So, and then the reason I just just to uh, um, uh, loop back is the reason I mentioned uh, this is that you have to be mindful of if you're going to follow along a path. You have to be. You have to know that you're getting all the information because mm -hmm. in this example that I just had explained that if if I decide I'm going to mail a hundred thousand postcards, but I don't know what's happening behind the scenes, mm -hmm. then I'm going to know what happens behind the scenes. But three months down the line, when I spend all this money and now I've got nothing to show for it. Right. And so that's what we're trying to avoid here today. Um, so a little bit of background on you. I mean, you've been in real estate for a while yeah how, how long have you been in real estate i uh, did my first deal in 2002 in 2002 mm -hmm. okay well so you were actually in real estate as a investor before me because I, I i did my deal in 2004 or 5. okay so you've done uh you've you've been through the crash obviously uh, yep. okay and uh and in terms of your print your primary strategy for real estate has a primary model of making money has always been wholesaling right uh, well, no. No, uh, okay. In, in 2002, I did my first deal. I didn't even know what wholesaling was. Oh, interesting. Right? Okay. This is before uh, before ListSource came out or you could pull names actually directly off the internet. Like okay. when I first got started, there was none of that. Okay. So uh, I remember reading the book Multiple Streams of Income by Robert Allen. Robert Allen, yeah. And he said, go find out-of-state owners. And so I was living up in Santa Barbara at the time. Right. And I called the county and found out that they had these names there. Of, uh, that you can go look up, but you actually had to go physically, manually look them up because right. uh, Santa Barbara wasn't on the 
digital system yet, and there was okay. no service to buy them from. Right. So I went down there, brought some bagels down there from Einstein Brothers Bagels, <laughs> and uh, I literally opened up a book, and there was dust like all inside the book, just like in the movie The Ghostbusters. Oh, really? Interesting. That, okay. That scene. That's how they kept their records. And that's how they kept their records. Okay. And so I uh, manually wrote down, it was like 38 names. Right. Now, the beauty of this, right, is that if it's that hard to get names, there's nobody else mailing. Right, right. Hand wrote 38 names. Uh, I got one phone call, locked up a house under contract. Wasn't in that. <laughs> Those are the good old days. The good old days, and I <laughs> yeah. locked up a deal. Right. Um, and it's funny because I didn't really understand how wholesaling worked, and I I, I used the term double close, and right. I called one or two title companies. They had no idea what that was. <laughs> Anyway, found a deal, found a partner. We bought the deal with traditional financing. Okay. And then we turned around and sold it. And we made 80 grand. I took home 40. He took home 40. Oh, okay. Okay. But during that time, uh, you know, I, I, I was experimenting, right? I was doing owner finance deals. I was doing uh, uh, sub twos, lease options, mm -hmm. master leases. And so I was just trying a little bit of everything. I was that one man show doing everything where all the knowledge was in my head. Right. Right. And so uh, during this phase, I still had a job, but I felt like I couldn't gain traction as a solopreneur. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like um, I, I needed a change. Right. right. I was working really, really, really hard. And in 2010, I made it to the crash. Right. I, I woke up and I looked at my wife one day and I said, I don't want to go to work. Today. Oh, I remember you telling that story. Right. Yeah. But yeah. I was, I was, I'd already quit my job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Except I just realized I had a job. Right. Uh, but I was just w working like a dog. And so at that moment, I hired a business coach and mm -hmm. he said, hey, you've got to find one thing that you can do really well, right. repeat it, and then hire other people to do okay. that. And because of that, we picked wholesaling at the time. I see. Now, okay. why wholesaling? Well, we were making money. It was easy. Uh, we saw direct mail as a way. There weren't a lot of people doing it at the time. And so that's right. why we chose wholesaling. Now, since 2009, 2010, that's been uh, probably 70%, 80% of my activity. Of, of your activity. I've done okay. some uh, you know, multifamily and mobile home park investing. Um, and I've held some properties during that time. But my main, my, my business main driver, vehicle right. that generates cash on a day-to-day -day basis is, is wholesale. And you were always doing, uh, I mean, uh, you were doing direct mail, and at uh, one point, I think you, you said you got up to a pretty large volume of direct mail, right? Yeah, I was doing about 200,000 pieces a month. 200,000 pieces a month, yeah. okay. And we're, we're certainly not doing that now, uh, but at one point, that was our, our height. And it's funny because uh, before the market got to where it was, we decided to go into Los Angeles. Oh, and, interesting, uh, we, okay. And we had done our San Diego mailings. I remember sending out 200,000 pieces all at once in LA. Oh, in LA, oh, really, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> and how many uh, how did that uh, how many calls did that, that uh, one man, time and, you, you uh, just, one time just oh my God. all at one time holy cow yeah. okay um, but it's, 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 it's a miracle <laughs> you know it, it's funny it's a miracle we made our money back we broke even on that oh mailing. interesting yeah um, but you know it, it, uh, I was proud of myself for taking action, but it was a, it was a foolish way right. at the time to make it happen. But so then now the the the, the one thing oh there goes uh, oh look there goes my uh, my my wife uh, hey Roz hey to Roz how's it going Roz they might be in the video uh, just for a second hey <laughs> hi <laughs> my uh, uh, yes uh, say hello this is a. Uh, my older daughter Alex, my younger daughter Kelly. This is one of our friends that she brought with us. Hey, uh, this is Todd Toback. This hey, is my nice wife Roz. Nice Roz. Yes, and uh, did you guys know we were here? No. Justin. Justin, Justin. remember Justin? Oh. You see him? <laughs> they see, see him in the team yeah. call. Yeah. 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 So we're here on vacation, and we're staying at a Airbnb across the way. And so my, we just, you guys just happened to come over, yeah. hanging out, and uh, now we're recording. So yeah. look at that. <laughs> yeah, we are recording. We are recording. So you guys will probably have to be at the recording. Yeah. But not there. No, that's it's here over there. Yeah. Roz does never wants to be in the recording. Oh, it's okay. Live. Whenever you edit a video, okay. Justin, whenever you edit a video, you have to get right written prior authorization from Roz I wish if she's in the video. <laughs> <laughs> that has she doesn't know that's been violated a couple of times uh, already. Marion's a Marion's a <laughs> Two hours later. So what I want to talk about here is you were as a solopreneur, right? Mm -hmm. As we all start, you do everything yourself, and then now you get to the point of you're, you, you've, hit, you, you've hit your limit. You can't do everything yourself right. and or you're restricting your opportunities or your income. Right. And so one of the things I want to talk about is how does one go, because I think the mistake that people make is number one is they take too long. 
to right. let go. And then when they do bring in the others, they bring in the wrong people or yep. the wrong position at the wrong time. Right. And so um, you and I agree on, on that very much so. So if somebody is, let's say that, uh, you tell me if you agree or disagree. In the beginning, you're trying to get your first couple deals, it's all you. You have to know that, that okay, so you laugh. So I wanna know, so if somebody is starting a brand new, right, and they're just trying to get their first deal, I always say that, hey, you gotta do everything yourself, you gotta get your first two or three deals under your belt so you know exactly how to do the business, everything else, before you start getting others involved. But you're smart, your, your, your laugh says that maybe you don't, you disagree. So I'd like to know about that. Like at what stage should someone start thinking about hiring? Well, you know, it's funny because, uh, Sometimes when you coach people, like you think one thing, and then when you start coaching, right, right, you actually start coaching another because you think this is the way it's supposed to be done, and then you actually then you look at the way you actually did it, right, and you're like, no, this is how actually I did this. So really quick, when I decided to go out on my own, right, let me just hold on. Okay, go ahead. So when I decided to go out on my own, right, I remembered now that I actually had never done a true wholesale deal before I decided to hire somebody. Oh, interesting, okay. And I know, so I had done some lease options and some owner finance, so I'd met with a motivated seller. So let right. me, you know, and I'd, I'd done many of those deals, but I had actually never done that. And it's really funny because at the time, I remember I hired my first acquisition specialist, and an acquisition specialist is someone who's gonna meet with a seller on your behalf, right? right, to do that. And so I remember when I decided to make that pivot, I actually decided that I needed to hire somebody. For that role. For that role, because I knew that I couldn't keep up with the volume of the direct mail that I was going to be sending out. Right. Now it is that moment actually that I, that's when I came in contact with your materials. Okay. Right, is that someone, uh, uh, mutual friend, Luis Ontiveros. Oh yes, I uh, remember that. He was one that. of your yeah. students. Yeah. He had told me that uh, he had used your system to find cash buyers. So I'm like, hey, you know, if I'm gonna hire somebody, right. and I'm gonna be uh, locking up deals, I gotta sell these deals. And right. he goes, hey, you gotta check out Chris Chico's postcard. Oh, interesting, okay, I forgot so, about that, yeah. Uh, I used your cash buyer postcard, right. and I, I say this a lot, uh -huh. um, to actually find all of my initial cash buyers to who I have this day. Oh wow, interesting, right? okay. And so, uh, by the way, if anyone wants to use Chris's stuff, don't change like one step of it. Your cash buyer postcard is like literally the best tool out there for flying cash buyers, in my in my opinion. Yeah, and that was that was that the blind was that the blind copy? the blind postcard. Yeah, the blind, blind postcard. Copy. Which interestingly enough, I yeah. see that postcard on a bunch of different sites because I guess people use it and they give it to a mail house, but they're always different. They're always like mess it up. It's they like a Frankenstein, Frankenstein version of the. Yeah. All right. So then now, um, so the question I had about that is that, but you knew how to do a real estate transaction. I you knew, knew about the HUD and everything else. Yep. So although you hadn't done a wholesale deal before, you knew how to talk to sellers. Yeah. Because so in other words. Could, could you say that somebody has to know what the conversation with a seller is and how that whole conversation flows and be competent in that before hiring for that role or is that not necessary? Well, here's what I would do right. in, in this is that you want to ha start with the end in mind. Right. Right. You want to start with the end in mind. And so if you want to send out some mailers or do Facebook marketing or do pay-per-click marketing or do bandit signs, that's okay. Right. But I would start in my mind, who is the first person I want to hire? Right. Right. Who is the first person who I want to hire? What do I expect from them? What do I want them to do? What are the outcomes? Right. And, 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 and write that down. And if you want to do some mailers and drive revenue and meet with sellers, I think that's a great idea. Right, we talked a little bit about this camera that you've got to keep your eye on revenue because if you're hire, trying to hire people and train them and figure out the business at the same time, that is going to be difficult. Right. So what I would do is I would start out as I start recruiting from day one. Right. I would start meeting with sellers at the same time, doing the deals, driving the revenue, following up, and as I was recruiting and as, as I was learning, start to document my process. I see, got and, it. And, and along the way. Okay. Right? And then as soon as I felt like I could delegate the lowest, the, the stuff that I was the worst at, right, and that I wasn't any good at, and then I hated, I would start with those activities and then give up the revenue generating activities and the stuff that you love the best. Now my best guess is that if you're watching this and you're kind of entrepreneurial, right. most entrepreneurs, right they tend to be good at sales, not everybody. Right. But most entrepreneurs tend to be good at sales and so you don't need to give up that role first. So, so like my example is, I might be good, like if I'm in front of you as a seller, mm -hmm. I might be good at having a conversation with you, but I was always a horrible salesperson mm -hmm. because I'm not a quick start. 
I would spend all day organizing my leads in my CRM and procrastinate all day long because like even to this day, if we're doing any sort of marketing test or in, and I got leads coming in right. and I'm say I'm going to talk to the sellers because I want to know the, the motivation levels, my wife has to pester me the entire day and I will wait to the very, very end in order for me to call those leads. Right. Because like, so for me, I look at it as like, uh, I was the opposite. Right. I, 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 I'm the worst salesperson, not because I can't talk to sellers, but because I hate the aspect of the whole follow-up and the leads and everything else. So for right. if, if I was starting out brand new, uh, would that be, would you recommend, if I hadn't done a deal before, that I would have to just like, um, uh, I would have to go through the process of at least working through that to have an understanding before I could delegate that? Or could I have somebody just go through a yeah. course of material and then be able to delegate that right off the I would that? hire, like for your personality, yeah. I'd hire a crazy man. Okay. You know, like right. someone who's gonna drive revenue, someone's really, really hungry. I'd hire someone, uh, P, you know, PC here, but I'd hire someone really, really hungry right. who doesn't have, you know, a lot of experience. <laughs> right, okay. Right, and I would teach them what I know. Right. Right, which is more than like, again, sometimes we think, well, I don't know X, Y, Z, but we underestimate right. our knowledge. Right, right. Right, so, and then I would give them the minimal amount of information right. needed to go out and do a deal. So right. something that, again, I'm a big fan of, if you're not good at sales, get a salesperson on immediately. Right, right, right. Okay. And so I'd say, look, bring me motivation. Get on the phone and find someone with a problem, Okay. right? I don't want you to learn how to comp. I don't want you to look at a screen. If you're watching the screen, you're losing money. Got it, Get okay. on the phone and bring me a problem, right? And then let's close the deal together. Got it, okay. Um, so that's my recommendation if you if you stink at sales. So if, if the opposite, if you're like, I think most investors are, because I spoke with one the other day and he's like, I hate doing all the marketing stuff. I hate doing the Facebook ads. Yeah. If, all, if all I did was all day out in the street, talking to people, shaking hands and doing deals, I'd be in heaven. Right. That person is, would be the opposite of me. That'd be the opposite. So in other words, if that person was the one that was thinking about their role, they would hire more of an admin person first, right? Yes, right. so they want to hire an admin first, but here's the problem with that, right? right? Is uh, there's, a, there's a whole art to delegating, right? right? So a lot of these people were like, I want to drive, 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 drive. I want to get in the phone, do deals. If I could do this, blah, blah, blah. A lot of times people like that, they don't have the skills to delegate, which needs to be learned. So what they okay, do is something I learned from a strategic coach is the drive-by delegation. Right. So they're like, here, do my marketing. I'm gonna go out and meet with a motivated seller. Right, yeah. And all of a sudden now the marketing completely falls apart or they mail the wrong list or the more, more, more postcards or it doesn't go out on time or they change the wording on the postcard with right. not enough direction. Right. Right, so <sighs> it's important that if you are that salesperson, you're hiring that admin, that you really take the time to uh, write down what you expect from right. that admin, the end result, what their boundaries are, right. right? how much money they can spend, when they should come to you, when they can't come to you, and lay those ground rules. But if you're a good salesperson, hiring a, a good admin is one of the best things that you can do as a, as a first step. So let's say if we look at, say, somebody that is um, looking to hire a team, would you say that, let's say, the ideal team would be, let's say, including you, would be a three-person team, you, an acquisitions person, and the uh, admin person, that that would be a very, a good core team that somebody could strive to put together that would be highly profitable and allow them to be able to not be day-to-day -day in the business? Yeah, you know, I think you could really push the envelope. Right. Uh, if you've got a really, really, really good virtual assistant. Okay. Right, and I'm talking, and, and I hate the term VA sometimes. Right. Right, because they most people, what they do is they just give VAs a like a list of tasks and a robot to right. do this and do that and they give this person no real accountability no over direction, the business right. and no direction right and so this person can only work inside the box right but literally if someone had a really 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 good VA right and they gave them the system and a really good acquisitions person uh, and a really, really good title company, you can actually treat your title company as an, a, an internal member of your team if you do that the right way, right? They can almost handle all your closings front to back. Yeah. Right, we, so we can talk about that a little bit Yeah, more. We, yeah actually, it's interesting because uh, I had a little bit of a mindset block when I heard, I, I've watched your videos, so yeah. I'll put in the description, in the link here, I'll put a link to your your group. Okay. Because I've watched all your videos. Okay. Because uh, I, I think they're actually quite good. Okay. I downloaded them and I listened to them in the car. Okay. Uh, so um, one of the ones that I had a little bit of a mental block against that was that when you said that you can get your title company to do a lot of the stuff that you said that they were, they were yeah. doing. And I said to myself, 
why would I maybe I'm, it's just a mindset shift and like my title company would do all that for mm -hmm. me yeah. so maybe talk a little bit about that because then it seems like if we're looking at the ideal team you have you as the as the, as the head right yeah. as a director you have the acquisitions person yeah you have the admin yeah. but then the other part of the team is the uh, title company the title company yeah because that was something that uh, could we talk about that like because uh, most people are yeah uh, that, that was something that to me even thinking about it I'm like I think Todd's a little bit nutty when he talks about that so talk about that. sure well I learned this by accident right so I learned this the opposite way. Okay. So we had someone working for disposition right. for us, right? And this, and when the deals came in, her job was to make sure the deals got pushed through, no matter what, to speed up closing. Right. Right. So, you know, we used to lock up the deals. She used to call up the seller and do the something that we call a button up. She used to call yeah. the buyer. She used to make sure that EMD was in. If there was any title issue. She was calling the city and doing this and doing that. And I noticed that as time went on, our title company was getting worse and worse and worse mm. right so at one point we had some deals fall out right right which kind of didn't happen but I always have a saying in our company that where there's smoke there's fire if you notice things happening in chunks right there's a problem right right so if deals are falling apart it almost always falls down to the person communicating with the buyer <laughs> excuse me the seller right okay <laughs> And so uh, I got on the phone and I went to go meet with our title company. I'm like, hey, what's going on? Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna make up a fake name here because I don't want to incriminate right, anybody. Right. Um, and she and she's like, well, we don't do that anymore because Kylie always does that on your oh, team. Oh, okay, interesting. And I'm like, what? They're like, yeah, well, we don't do that because Kylie already does that. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, so I actually made my title company less lazier, e less effective, right? Less effective because right. I had someone on my team pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. Right. So, it, so I brought in someone uh, in our company uh, who worked with Tony Robbins. Oh, and interesting. He, okay. was, he was our sales manager okay. for a while, right? And right. working with us. And he says, I, I don't get what this person's supposed to do. Right. This looks primarily right. like an admin role. Right. Right. And he's like, why don't? He's like, you're already paying the title company to do this. Why don't they already do oh, that? Oh, interesting. How much are you paying them? I go, well, we don't actually pay them. He's like, well, I'm looking right here at the closing statement. You're paying them. Right. You know, a thousand, fifteen hundred dollar transactions. Like you are paying them. You have a right. total mindset shift. And I'm yeah, like, that's interesting. Them. Yeah, because it's somebody looking. At, I'm from the outside looking into your business. Right? Outside, right? Yeah. Right. So he's like, "What?" And and I'm like, "Well, they would never do this. Same exact thing." Yeah. And by the way, Rich, if you're watching this, I, you know, thank you. He goes, "Is that true?" Right. I said, "They'll never do that." And he looks right. at me. He goes, "Is that true?" Right. And I'm like, "I don't know." Right. So I wrote down everything, the heart, the expectations, front to back, mm -hmm. on what the title, what I want them to do. Right. Right. And I'm like, hey, within uh, within uh, one hour of getting the contract, I want you to call the seller. I want you to schedule a time with them to send uh, get the paperwork signed. Right. Right. I want you to uh, look for the EMD from the buyer. I want you to confirm. I want you to communicate with them. If they don't send it in. I want you to tell them that we're going to cancel the contract. Right. Right. If there's any title issues, I want you to contact the city. I want you to get down. Yeah. The thing. Do all the legwork and everything. Uh, now the funny thing is, a lot of times we get scared about this, and it sounds nutty. Yeah. But when there's a title problem, right? What do most title companies do? Yeah, most. You know, it's an interesting question. Most title companies will take care of it because they're dealing with people that are not used to dealing with real estate transactions. Like say, would, would you like say like a regular homeowner and a regular buyer? They have no idea how to do that right. or how to fix it, so they have to fix it. Right. Right. Or the real estate agent, but they're, they're they're still making one phone call. Right. 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 They're still making one phone call, and then they have to call you. Right. And then you're going to have to send someone on your team to go deal with it. Right. And then you're going to have to call them back, and then so there's this chain. So what I found out was that once I started setting these expectations with a title company, right. their job got much easier. Oh, interesting. Because they, they had full control of getting done what they needed to get done. We were the bottleneck. We were the bottleneck. Oh, interesting. Now, because when you said that, at first I was thinking, would the title company say, you ain't paying us enough money to do that? Right. Or do you need a certain number of volume of deals to send them for them to say, or or no? That, that's a, the thing that I thought about. Uh, it, it, no, okay. you know, but I think the biggest thing is that if you go in with the promise of more volume, but the title companies who we work with yeah. understand that this is actually less work for them. Got right? it. Because every time like we had a real estate agent get involved, yeah. you know, we do some deals with real estate agents. So right. sometimes the agents, they want to get their hands in it. I see. Right? So and just... they, they, always, like, they always muck up the deal, right? right? In terms of making the closing and complicating things. 
and you want to get involved in title problems. And so those deals are always more challenging than the ones where escrow or title is dealing directly with a seller. So it's really a combination of, uh, number one, like you said, setting the right expectations. That's, I mean, that's 95% of it. Yeah, selling, um, uh, selling the, the concept of it to the title company in the sense that, number one, you're going to be providing them deals on a consistent basis. Number two, that right. you're making their job easier, not harder, yeah. because you're getting out of the way yeah. and you're allowing them to make decisions. Because at the end of the day, all you care about is a closing. Right. And nobody gets paid un unless the deal closes and yep. they want that same thing as well. Yeah. Okay. And then now, so if we look at that team, uh, one of the questions I had is, um, if you look at that core team, what do you? What's your target when you're building a team in terms of your margin that you want to be at when you consider your staff costs uh, and that sort of thing? Sure. Do you have well, a particular target. Percentage? Yeah. So I, I've looked into a lot of people's businesses. Yeah. Right? I want to talk about that. A couple right. things. I want to. Not to. I asked you that question, but also let's go back to something that we talked about before I turned on the recording, which was that a lot of times what you see out there is not what the reality is and you said that many times you look at a profit and loss statement so what are some of the horror stories when you look at a wholesaler that you see is oh doing a bunch of deals and then when you look at their actual profit and loss statement um, what do you see yeah so uh, you know I had one client who's bragging about doing 200 deals a year right uh, you know had like six or seven you know team members on staff mm -hmm. and he was like in eight different markets okay right um, so and, something that people every if you saw that you would be like oh my god I want to I want to know do exactly what he said exactly right right, okay. right. long story short uh, you know the business was losing money right and I asked him for a personal financial statement uh, and he was completely in the red in the red completely okay. in the red um, and a lot of times you know we, we close our eyes right where we're lying to ourselves on what the business looks like. But right. I, I see a lot of people have these bigger teams and they're running right now at like a 20% profit margin, right? right? With, a, with a lot of headache. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with building a big, uh, a big business, right? right? The one thing I wanna talk about is that there is no middle ground. If you try to go middle ground, you will lose your rear end. Okay. So you can go be one to two million and that's where you're gonna be. You could have a profit margin. I'll talk about the numbers there. Yeah. But if you wanna try to squeak past that, you're going to have to go to 10. I see. Right. right. You're going to have to go to 10 because then the infrastructure that you will need to support more will not support the one to two. Uh, well, it won't support a, a three to four. I see. Got right. It, got it. It, it, the, the, the infrastructure that you need for a three to four is the same that you need for a 10. Right. Right. Yeah, that and makes sense. So, um, you can build. So to answer your question, you can have a three person team and have a one to two million dollar wholesaling business that's going to generate 40 to 50 percent profit margins per okay. year. Yeah, right. and that's what I was thinking. I was thinking that the 40 to 50% should be the target. Yes. Right, and in general, um, what, what do you typically, what, what do you say is the suggested amount to pay an acquisitions person? What, what's the, because uh, some people pay 10%, some people I've seen pay 35 or 40%, yeah, which no, I think that, is too that's high. Nonsense. So what, what's the uh, what's the, 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 the range there for an acquisition person? You know, you person? can go 10 to 20%. 10, 10 to 20%. 20 uh, if you're in a higher market, uh, I found 20 is a little rich. Uh, so it's 20 is a, is a little bit too high. Um, you know, I know some people who have like one employee, right? And that person does everything, the front right. to back, you know, uh, and they'll pay that person 20%. That's a different story. Right. Uh, but you know, 10 to 18% is, is what I found that the business can afford. And I think it's really important. Let's talk about, you know, a lot of people, they feel guilty and they like the people and, you know, they yeah. want to feel like everybody's a partner. What happens is that you're going to put yourself out of business. Got it. Um, you know, so if you're paying someone 50%, and you're paying 20% for marketing, and yeah. you know you were having an admin. Well, now you're operating at like a 15, a very small margin, right? Small margins. So you have to remember, it's not what you can afford; it's what the business can afford. Okay, and then now, if you if you have somebody at that, is there a target? income range that you're saying, hey, I got to have enough deals and got to be able to have enough margin that if somebody were to come in full time and do the acquisitions that they need to make at, le at least X amount gross so that at the end of the year, then it makes sense for somebody to be full time, right? Because if you're asking somebody to be a full time acquisitions person, yeah. you know, what's that amount? Like, in other words, um, is it that, you know, hey, you got to structure the compensation and the, your leads flow so that they can make 60, 70, 100 grand a year? Is there a particular number? Do you look at it that way at all or no? Yeah, I mean, you want someone to be able to eat, right? right? But because you know, eating I, in Miami might be different than eating in Idaho. Sure, but look, at the <laughs> end of the day, cavi we eat caviar for breakfast, and yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, someone's going to need, you know, to be making at least thirty grand a year, right? right. I mean, I mean, that's like the absolute minimum, you know, right. minimum, right? So it doesn't have to be that way. Maybe the first two, three months, right? But it can, it, you know, 
after month four, you want to start to see some juice and some growth for right. these people. Very, very, very important. Um, Are you paying them a salary in the beginning? Uh, so you can pay a draw. A draw. Right? So it's funny because I really want to encourage you if you're watching this video that the first person I brought on, remember right. I'd never done a full wholesale deal. Uh-huh. Uh, they came out 100% commission. Right. They just wanted my knowledge and my training and my energy. But most of, most of all, they wanted my confidence. Right. And my belief in them. That was the number one asset that you have is my confidence and my belief right. in them. Very, 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 very important. Okay. And so if you do that, that's going to be a, a much more powerful than a two to $3,000 a month draw against right. commission. Right. Uh, now, the beauty of this is people might be scared of this. and like, oh, I don't know if I can afford that. Well, you're not putting out a year's salary. Right. I can tell within 45 days whether someone's got the juice or not. Right. Right. So worst case scenario, you're out $3,000. Right. Uh, well, here's some, go ahead. The other thing, I was, before hiring an acquisitions person, you should have at least one channel that you know that is a viable channel for you that you can afford that's producing viable leads. Because yep. you don't want to bring somebody in when there's no leads or anything like that, right? right? Mm -hmm. I, okay. I agree with that statement. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of, let's say, if you're, you said 10 to 18 so you said 10 to 18% for an acquisitions person, yep. right? And then let's say um, if you're going to hire a virtual assistant, yeah. uh, one of the things that I always don't like is when people say, oh, I hire a VA to make my calls and do all these things in my business. No, and I ask, I ask, how much are you paying them? And they're like, oh, I'm paying them $400 a month. And they can't figure out why they can't get anything done. And I think that there's, you have to pay for quality, right? Meaning that, so what would you say is a reasonable amount? Are you, when you tell, when you say, hey, somebody should have a strong virtual assistant, are you talking about somebody overseas? Are you talking about somebody US? And is there some sort of uh, price point that you find that, hey, you're gonna find somebody of good quality in order to help you in your business if you're paying X amount of money? Sure, well, you know, there's certainly things that virtual assistant can do really, really, really well. Right. right? And uh, you can really push the envelope there. Okay. Right? And I think it goes back to training and, and keeping them engaged and making them feel like they're part of the team, which they should be. Right. Right. I mean, they should be able to go to a webinar or Zoom and there should be a conversation uh, there. But there's going to be some stuff that a local assistant can do for you Got that it. a virtual yeah. assistant can. So I personally don't think that a virtual, if you're just starting out, a virtual assistant should be making your calls for you, right? That should yeah, not, I would agree, yeah. That's not, agree. Sh should not be happening. But a really good virtual assistant can do everything but talking to sellers. I see. I mean, okay. they can literally do everything in your business besides talking to sellers. Okay. Right? And so, you know, like the biggest thing is, uh, you know, you specialize in Facebook marketing, right? right? So the one thing they can be like, look, I want you to pull a report every single week on how many Facebook leads came in, right? right? And what was our, uh, you know, uh, uh, lead to appointment ratio, what was our close ratio, what was the revenue? And I want that in front of me every single Monday. I got right? it. And right. I want the same for bandit signs, and I want the same for direct mail, and I want the same for our bird dog program, our door knocking program, or our cold calling program, but get that in front of me. I want to know our numbers, and that is your job to figure out. If you have questions, feel free to ask Got me. it, right. Right? You know, but she's not the one talking to the sellers or following up on the lead. No, no, Do you no, recommend, no, no. like, could a virtual assistant be, let's say, and some, some teams, and I'd be curious to know about this, some teams have the acquisitions person, and some teams have a lead manager. Right. And they keep them segregated. Have you ever been a fan of that? Is that something that you had implemented in the past? Uh, you know, there's, there's plus and minuses to right. that. Here's what I have found. In our, in our business, right now I know some people who have a lead manager right but what happens is sometimes a lot's lost in translation yeah so a lot of times a lead manager will um, will not pass on leads that should be passed on that is true yeah. right that, yeah. that, that should be passed on and then sometimes they pass on leads that shouldn't be passed on and so I think a really good acquisition specialist you know they want every lead that comes because they want to be able to sniff out the motivation. Want to sniff and, out, yeah. Right? Now, okay. granted, if you're doing a ton of cold calling, a ton, and you've got prospectors yeah. coming through, and there's so many leads coming in, and they can't handle it, well, you need to either hire another acquisition specialist, right. which I'm a big fan of, right. or get a lead manager I see, in I place. Know. But here's what happens, and I'm like, not a lot of people talk about this. Right. But what you do with a lead manager sometimes is, uh, by the way, if you're a solopreneur and you don't want to let go of sales, hiring a lead manager sometimes is a great idea. Okay. But when you hire salespeople, you have to be really careful about is making your salespeople lazy with a lead manager. Because then the salespeople say, I only, in their mind, they're like, I only want the low hanging fruit. Yeah. I don't want to work for it. I don't want to prospect. If someone's not ready to jump off a cliff, I don't want to talk to them. like a person. prima donna. Like, like a I don't want to touch anything Look, unless it's a. Uh, it's, uh, you said it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you will turn your salespeople into right. a prima donna. Okay. So if I talk to anybody, whose business is starting, the conversion's going down, and profitability is going down. Right. Right, and something's going on almost always, they've got a lead manager. 
Interesting. Right? Oh, that's an interesting thing. Okay. Right? So, so that's one of the first things I ask. I go, how many layers? So I've got a consulting client right now who is trying to go from uh, zero to like a six-person team, and there's going the leads got going through six people. Uh -huh. And the first thing I did is like, nope, chop, 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 chop. Oh, yeah. I was like, one person get the lead because the other issue is that when you're adding team members, especially if you're starting out, yeah, there's a point. Look, if you've got a you know 40-person team and you don't want to hire anybody and you've got an HR department, fine. I'm not saying these things are bad. Right. But look, when it's just you and your first hire, like yeah. hire one person at a time. Yeah. Because when you add multiple things at multiple times and things stop working or not working, you don't know what was the breaking point. Right. Right. And so you throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. 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 And, and so everything's bad, everything's good. You know, and so you want to do one thing at a time, one hire at a time, one process at a time, and tweak it until you know it's working. What about uh, this position? Is that a separate role? Uh, um, well, so here's the beauty the about something. Uh -huh. so, so for us, we list everything on the MLS. Oh, that's right. right? Okay. We you list everything on the yeah. MLS. And there's a, you know, I don't want to create like the, you know, first thing that people will say is, oh, you can't do that in my market. You gotta right. So I say, okay, don't ask if you can do it in your market. Ask how can you do that right. in your market, right? Because there's a million different ways that you can do it legally, right? Right. Um, you just gotta, you know, stay with it within the laws of your state. And so we get our, uh, uh, basically a real estate agent, internal, external team member, right. right, is trained on the way that we do things. We've got a process see, and we it. treat them like an employee, but they know exactly how we want to do things, how we want to be communicated, how they communicate with a title company once we've got a buyer, right, right, and we push that onto them. I got it. So with every transaction you do, do you automatically have enough spread to facilitate, say, a 6% commission or whatever the commission is? It's a lot less than that. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I want to get into percentages, but in essence, in your in your agreement, you have a, uh, a percentage that you've, uh, you've, you've that, that's, uh, uh, that's in the deal that you have, um, that will, the deal will sustain uh, another real estate agent potentially if, if they have, and then your listing agent, whatever fee. Yeah. And having. I, and I wouldn't do that if we weren't netting more. Right. So we're actually netting more and doing less work. Got it. Because of the fact that it's out in the open market versus... Yes. Right. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because then the other issue with that is, is if you don't have that and if you're constantly going to one or two buyers, then, I mean, I think about... Then you, you're restricting yourself. Yep. Yeah. Because I remember there's a deal. My biggest deal, my biggest deal that I ever had was the one in Miami that I was literally, I think, 30 minutes away. And the difference was between making fifteen thousand on a deal to making the ninety-five thousand oh, on a yeah. deal. And the fit, I had a guy, I had a buyer, and he said, "I'm going to take the deal at this," and I had nobody else. And then I almost took the deal. I said, "Well, give me ten to fifteen minutes." And literally, uh, thirty minutes later, I had a uh, an offer come in through an agent and I had no idea where but they came to me and they offered me yeah. so much more money than and yeah. had I and this the guy that I was dealing with was a very very experienced investor and he yeah. had his numbers down and everything else I had no idea what they were planning on doing with the property that yeah. they paid so much but it wasn't my responsibility I think also um, that is it a bit more hands you're allowing the market to dictate and you're not really because the, the, the other challenge that I have is that when you're dealing too intimately with buyers if a buyer says to you hey how much I'm gonna make on this deal then I don't want to be caught saying well I think you can make X and if they don't make X then all of a sudden now um, it changes so yeah. getting the deal out into the open market and allowing whatever price the market dictates is your is, is your main and that's, strategy. that's my strategy you know I invented the auction well actually I shouldn't say I invented I learned this auction method from Peter Conti and David Finkel through lease options. Right, okay. So they had this lease options, they taught me this method in, le in lease options, and then I brought that over into wholesaling, okay. right? And then we'd have like these little uh, auctions at the house, right, we'd drive up the price. Then we went to the MLS, which is a whole nother game, right? Like, right. wow, so we're leaving a lot more money on the table. But here's, let me talk about something on why sometimes we leave money on the table. Right. Can I talk about that for yeah, a second? Yeah. So if you would have asked you, hey, Chris, do you want to leave $75,000 on the table? Right. What would you have said? No, I would say no. No. I want my, I want my 75K. Well, <laughs> what happens? Like, like, like why, do, why do we do that sometimes? Um, and my example was that uh, I, I, the, would be fear. Fear of I'm not going to be able to get the property sold, so i got to take the best deal that I have right now. Right. Right? Well, also, it's part of the mind scramble. Right. Right. So if you're a solopreneur right. and you're working, you're doing everything in the business, your mind 
whether you, whether you like it or not, is all over the place. You're like, hold the seller, hold the buyer, hold the title company. When's my mail going out? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. You're all over okay. the place, right? And so you get to this place where you're like, you're, you're, it's a rush to do everything. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And because of this, you're trying to just get out of this transaction as fast as possible so you could hustle your way to the next to one. To the next one, yeah. And then you start making mistakes. Okay, that's a good point, yeah. Right? Yeah. And so I noticed that once I started creating improvements in my business, right? Right? Then I started to create more room for me to step back and say, you know what, you gotta slow down here. Right. And start innovating and experimenting and be better. Yeah. Right? And so these little tweaks enabled me to take a step back and hiring people made me to breathe and to see that. And also too, if, if you got somebody else doing that for you, right? Then they're if it's that's the only position, they're gonna their whole role is extracting as much as they can out of extracting that. Extracting as of that much deal. as they can. Okay. Right. So so thinking about again the conversation about the team, uh, in essence, uh, core team like it's a and i guess this depends on the market but if you were to give a number let's say look if you had you and your acquisitions and you had uh say a strong admin and mm -hmm. you had the rest of the parts in place and you you had a reasonable way of getting leads would you say it's a it, would it be safe to say that look you somebody could easily make 250 500 750 a year with that really core team in terms of net home take pay if, if they yeah do. yes you know okay. like one you know if you're up in a 40 to 50 percent profit margin right, right you get one to two million you're looking at a half million dollars to a million dollars net right uh and so you know the uh you know we've got a uh, consulting client in indiana right uh -huh. who's, do, who's doing that that you know those very numbers yeah right you know and so uh you know we've been doing those numbers forever right and so you know i've scaled up i've scaled down i've scaled up i've scaled down right and it doesn't hurt the beauty part, the beautiful part about this business if you keep it simple you can have two acquisition managers and i, I recommend that right because right? then you have a redundancy and redundancy comes out leaves and then you're not it's, it's not if someone leaves it's when they leave, leave yeah. or you have to let somebody go you know being in sales look let's call it like it is it's it's hard now would you hire somebody that say comes to you and says Look, if I came to you, I said, Todd, um, I, I want to be a real estate investor, mm -hmm. but I'd like to work with you, and eventually, a year and a half later, I, yeah. I think I'll probably leave. Well, I made a video uh, on that exactly on my channel. I okay. You watched that. Um, no, I, maybe I did, but maybe I don't remember. Uh, what was your answer to that? Would you well, hire that person? Uh, well, it, it, the answer is maybe, right? Okay. The first thing I'm going to look at is the quality. So this, per, this person, right. fit, who I want to be around, right? Right. Are they fit our culture of our company? Right. Are they hungry? Are they coach? Are they, well, here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for coachable. Right. I'm looking for loyal. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm looking for consistency. Those are the three things. Right. Right. Coachable, loyal, and consistency. And if okay. they got those three, I could pretty much turn anyone into an absolute beast, right? The other part about that is then I set some very clear expectations. Right. Right. Look, I know you want to go on your own. I don't want to try to hold you back, but here's what I expect. I'm going to put my money, my time, and my energy right. into you, right? And so if you come on, I need at least a two-year commitment. Got right? it. And you can't be doing your own deals. You can't be doing side deals. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's a distraction. So we're 100% with me. If you want right. to learn, you're here learning. You're part of our team. And you'll probably make more here than you would on your own anyway. Right. Okay. Right? And so you set those expectations and you know, I'm not gonna hold them to it legally. I just I, I just wanna have that heart to heart, look them in the eye. And it's worked very, very well for me. Well, because at the end of the day, then, like, if I'm doing that, if I'm the acquisitions person, then, um, then we're clear. Like, I'm coming in. I'm going to help you make money. I'm going to make money. Eventually, I'm going to leave. But while we're together, we're going to be working together yep. the best way we can. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. That yep. makes sense. Um, so then, um, so again, you know, I mean, I think. That the well, so, so let me I have one caveat with that. Though. Okay. A lot of times, someone makes a, a you know, a, meet somebody at your RIA, you know, a real estate investment club, right? Right. Like, oh, this guy wants to be a real estate investor. He goes. To all the RIAs, he must know what he's talking about, right? Right. And they hire the guy, and the guy has like another job, and he's working your leads part time. Right. Uh -uh, forget it. Kabosh that like immediately, right? Got if it. someone's coming on, yeah, right, it is full time or bust. That that is my that is like a non negotiable. Okay. And then in, in terms of uh, finding an acquisition person, I know that you you've done you know there's Craigslist, there's Indeed, there's different mm -hmm. websites. Is there any one particular source? You really got to spread yourself out and try to do the best you can. It's referrals. Well, I've got a rule number one: always be recruiting. So even if you don't hire somebody, you right. got to start doing you got to start doing this right away. And actually, we talked about this before uh, getting on camera. Uh, you we're in a new age, yeah. right? We're in a new age, uh, and so you've got to uh, start building your brand right now in your market. So right. I recommend that people uh, start a Facebook business page for their local market, their local house buying company, right. and start publishing videos immediately. Right? What do I talk about? I don't know. 
anything, right? right? You know, uh, the, the house that you just flipped, the house that you just wholesaled, uh, your new workout plan, your new six pack. I don't care what it is. You start to develop a presence in uh, that A market. presence. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I, I talked about the number one thing that you can give someone is confidence and leadership. Yeah, right. That's what they want. Right. And so your presence on YouTube and your desire, your entrepreneur, your willingness to be a leader and put yourself out there, mm -hmm. that raises you above like 99% of the population. Yeah. Right. You know, it's funny, like even, uh, you know, us doing these videos here, right? Right. Like, you know, it was, it was work, you know, we just put, put it on the tripod and right. the microphone, you know, you're going to have to like, you know, uh, edit out probably the birds that are flying in and there's work that's <laughs> right. involved right. in here, yeah. right? But, um, you know, you've been a leader in the space mm -hmm. forever and you've right. had massive influence and, right. you know, uh, I've learned a lot in this business, but I still learn yeah. from you. Yeah. So uh, my recommendation is to start today. Yeah. And the best hires that you will get is someone who watches your videos yeah. or your YouTube or your blog post by far because they want you. You're going to make a lot of mistakes in business, yeah. but they will forgive a lot when they believe that you are leading them in the right direction. It's funny because my the best person I had uh, one, uh, had worked with was a guy, named, a guy by the name of uh, Calvin, who was uh, uh, somebody who bought my course and information and they, they weren't able to pe put all the pieces together. Yep. And I said I was hiring somebody. He came on board and uh, um, and he eventually left, which him and I are still friends, yeah. we communicate, but I made money, he made money, he got the knowledge um, and, and now he's got the confidence to be able to do it on his own. And in the end, it was a win-win. It was a win-win. Yeah. And I, I like your approach. Um, and and you know the, the main reason why I wanted us to you know we would have gotten together regardless even yeah. if we didn't do this but the main reason that I, I wanted Todd to come on and and for us to have a discussion is because of the fact that um, things are not always what they seem out there in the world of Instagram in the world yeah. of everything you see and at the end of the day what matters is not the number of deals you make how it doesn't matter how big the team that you have is now doesn't matter the number of mailers that you have going out what matters is your bottom line I was say you t I would say it's your bottom line um, with uh, there's two there's two items how many how much did you make and how, how long did you work to make that yeah because if you had a great bottom line but you're working 120 hours a, a, a week that's a problem you know if you're making a tremendous bottom line and you're also working a lot less in your real estate business that's a pretty good combination yeah right and you know I think keeping an eye on uh, on that and I think that for most of most of the investors out there they can get and have an amazing um, you know, regardless if you want to do investing or passive income, we talked about that, buying properties, you need cash flow. Yep. And to me, is building up that $250,000, $500,000 a year, and you know, you're know, you going to get a point where you're not going to be able to do that by yourself. Mm -hmm. You're going to need somebody else. You're going to need to build a team. And keeping your eye on the fact that you, you're not going to go out and build a humongous team. you got to keep it tight, keep your eye on margins, and do it in a way so that at the end, you're building, you're building a team that doesn't require you to be day-to-day -day in the business mm -hmm. but still keeps a bunch of that money in your pocket because the other thing we didn't talk about is what if you have a 15 person team you have all this overhead and then the market takes a dip you know decreasing your spend is a lot harder than increasing your spend and getting out of that right, right. and making adjustments you know I know guys that if, if you have to make an adjustment on your market and you've got a big team that's different than say if you got to make an adjustment and it's, it's a very oh, yeah. small agile team yeah. and I, so I think that, uh, that that's the main reason I wanted to, to, to bring you on the channel um, I will put you have a channel YouTube channel as well yeah I highly recommend you guys watch uh, Todd's videos I have watched his video so I'm not telling you to do something I haven't done myself right. um, uh, I highly recommend I'll put a link in the description to his YouTube channel, also to a Facebook. Uh, you have a, is it a group that you have or a page? Where, where's your, all those videos that I watch of you? Sure, so I, I take the YouTube videos and I post them on the Lion Pride Real Estate Investing. Okay. So Lion Pride Real Estate Investing, that's our Facebook page. Uh, but they're, they're all repurposed from YouTube, so you can go check them okay. out there. Also. I'll put both of those links on there so you guys can uh, watch them. I recommend you follow this guy and uh, listen, I'm recommending you to follow him and to listen to what he has to say. There's no financial incentive in any way whatsoever. I don't care if you do anything with him. I'm recommending him because of the fact that I believe in what he says and he's somebody that I look for advice in regards to this realm here. And so um, just highly recommend that you, uh, you well, watch you, him that's very, and very generous. show him some thank love you. and show me some love. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell. I've said this a million times and I'll continue to say it again. Uh, do that and uh, if you have any additional questions if something isn't is unclear in the video that we just recorded make uh, make a comment 
let me know. I can always come back to Todd and say, hey, clarify this uh, or whatever. And uh, maybe might have uh, another video. Maybe I'll, you know, I gotta say, I, California, is the second place that I've driven the most that I have the most miles. Okay. I and know that. by default, whenever we don't have anywhere to go, I say, let's go to California. <laughs> so I have a feeling we're gonna be back in California soon. Uh, back in California, San Diego, and we'll get back together again and we'll do another video. Well I guess this is just one thing I just, I do want to talk about just really quick as yeah. kind of a parting shot. Um, you know if, if you feel like you're suffocating in your business, uh -huh. right, and you cannot get to leads fast enough or you're not following up yeah. fast enough. I always say, would you fire yourself if you were looking at uh, yourself uh, yeah. as the manager, yeah. right? Because, um, I mean, for me, I'm, I've am i really refined myself in sales, right. right? I'm not a natural born salesperson, but I've refined myself right. in, in that. Um, but the truth is, you know, like a follow through and follow up, that's not my yeah. you know, strong suit. Right. right? And, and if you're an entrepreneur, you're probably not. You're probably like a little like ooh, ooh, scattered. Right. So. You know, you may need to make that move sooner rather than, rather than later, later. Yeah, right. Yeah. And it takes it's going to take some courage and some movement and a little bit of leap of faith. And so, well, I think um, if, if would you say that if you feel like, oh my God, I got it, I got it, I'm, I have to hire. It. If you're hitting the emergency button, then you're already already too late. late. It's right. too late. Yeah, you're already well, well, not too late. Money. You should. You're already losing money. Right? <laughs> yeah, so, you're already. But, losing it, but money. if you make that one hire, just yeah. the one. Yeah. Right, that could take off like fifty percent of your work. Immediately. Right, so I, I, that, that's my perfect. Well, I appreciate you coming on, and uh, uh, well, we'll, see, we'll we'll have to do another one. All right. How about that? Thank you, All Chris. Right. Appreciate All right. it.